couldn't be. Because he has no jurisdiction on anyone on this side at all. But I know he's going to be talking about me. I say to you, Mr. Speaker, that the time has come for the nonsense to stop. Barbados must act as one in protecting the fiscal affairs of this country and the fiscal stability of this country. If the patient is bleeding, you have to stop the bleeding. You cannot spend 69 cents in each dollar. And I say it with all sincerity. You cannot spend 69 cents in each dollar. The glass cleaner, please. Glass is cleaner. Of every revenue you earn on debt, you cannot even pay wages with the money left back. So you are borrowing to pay salaries. You cannot even send money to the statutory corporations with the money left back. So you're borrowing to send transfers. You cannot buy a paper pin, a liter of gas, a catheter, an IV, a piece of paper. You can't buy a single thing with the money left back. So you are borrowing. So that is like a household. The household borrowing to pay rent. The household borrowing to buy food. The household borrowing to put gas in the car. The household borrowing to do everything. Not one Barbadian would submit themselves to that frolic and folly. That's where the frolic and folly is. But the problem is that if the Minister of Finance were the only body to face the consequences, or this government the only body to face the consequences, they say, well, leave him alone. But the people I just referred to and every other person across this country are the ones who are going to have to face the consequences. And there comes a time when economic decline is no longer being triggered by economic reasons. It starts to be triggered also by social implosion. When garbage stops being collected and the attendant costs for public health. When people start to worry and the blood pressure goes up or they get strokes. When violence starts to become more regular as we have been seeing regrettably in this country. And you will notice that the opposition has not been playing politics with it, and I want the AG to note that. Because we will not play politics with crime in this country. When people are making decisions to go overseas and live because they do not believe that they can see a way out for themselves in this country. When those social reasons become endemic, that triggers further economic decline that cannot be solved by economic reasons. A government can't make a man who has a stroke walk straight again by wishing him so, or by the government changing. A government cannot cause a family that has emigrated to return because there's a change of government all of a sudden, because the people are settled. A government cannot deal with the, the brutal human costs of rampant violence in small societies and bullets going to the wrong place and in the wrong people, as happened with the shots that went through the Orleans when it was two Saturdays ago. So when I say to the Prime Minister that we need to pause and fix and stop the bleeding, we need to have a national consensus. There are people outside of this parliament. There are people in this parliament. And this country is being held to ransom by a governor of the central bank who believes that Barbados must not refinance, as he told us in a newspaper article as recent as less than a week ago. I say to you, sir, that we have reached a point where this governor of the central bank has to start. We have to start asking ourselves questions about it. Because this is the same governor who no longer gives us an economic review anymore. It's political propaganda. Anybody who pulls the central bank quarterly report from five, six, seven years ago and one from recently will see that there is no review of the productive sectors of the country or the macro economy. He tells you about what projects, and we should have known it from the time he tried to tell us about the prison of 800 million. He's a political propagandist. This is the same governor of the central bank that bans the nation newspaper, or purports to ban the nation newspaper last year, from coming to press conferences. 
This is the same governor of the Central Bank that, Mr. Speaker, fails now to provide current data. And I invite the Prime Minister to go and pull the last few economic reviews and look at Table 1 and see wherever there is a blank space for current economic data. But the data all of a sudden miraculously appears because the people in the Central Bank cannot believe that the governor is presiding over this kind of tyranny of suppression of information for a country that is accustomed to accessing information and for a government that promised freedom of information as one of the things on which it was to be elected in this country. This is the same governor of the Central Bank that has presided over losses of the Central Bank year after year after year after year. Indeed, sir, since 2008, the Central Bank has only made money once. We would have thought that yesterday's budget was to be about the minister coming to tell us how he is going to deal with the accumulated losses of the Central Bank. That's what I would have expected the Minister of Finance to address in here yesterday. But maybe he did not want to tell the country that the Central Bank will now record another loss of $7.3 million in last year, 2014. Loss after loss after loss. And the loss last year becomes more insidious and worrisome because, Mr. Speaker, and I want members to listen to this, that the governor of the central bank chose to make two decisions that led to losses of $11 million between the two decisions, hence the overall loss of $7.3 million for the bank. One, holding over $400 million in treasury bills. The governor of the central bank chose to roll over those set treasury bills at 1% instead of 3%, causing a loss of $8 million on the interest that would otherwise be earned by those treasury bills. The governor of the central bank also chose to change the exchange rate in dealing with commercial banks, to encourage the commercial banks to bring the foreign exchange to the, the bank, central bank. Uh, as a result of that decision, did not achieve the desired outcome, but led to a further $3 million in losses at the central bank. So that his own intervention against the best advice of people, the governor has presided over $11 million in losses from those two decisions and the overall losses of the bank last year were $7.3 million. And what makes this worse, sir, is that this accumulated losses, the governor is the one advocating the laying off of one third of the staff of the central bank. A man that has reached 70, gotten a lifeline for five years and telling people in the central bank they are too old to remain in the central bank on career paths. What, what really have we come to, sir? What really have we come to? And so when he went to the bank insisting on removing one third of the staff from deputy governors right back down, the board told him, get an independent review. But do you know that the staff of the central bank are walking about nervous, Mr. Speaker, for the last few weeks because the independent review is to go to the board of the central bank next week? And people do not know whether they will continue to have a job at an institution with which they have worked for 20 and 30 years and 15 years. This is not how we do business in this country, sir. The Minister of Finance did not even address the issue of the recapitalization of the central bank. But yet he spoke for almost four hours. Nothing on tourism for jobs, nothing for international business, nothing for manufacturing other than to put a lash in them through the sweet drinks tax and other things that, of course, will affect them. Nothing, nothing on the central bank's losses and the urgent need for recapitalization. I say to you, sir, that Barbados needs to wake up and to recognize that it is being held hostage by a governor of the central bank. But you know, sir, I'm going to talk later in this debate 
about an action that is even more insidious than anything I've said so far in relation to the government of the Central Bank. Just stay tuned. Just stay tuned. You then have the situation, sir, of customs and bra. Minister did not address it in any detail. Private sector in this country have been complaining that their goods cannot be cleared because of things being held up because of the appropriate concern of the Customs Department in Barbados. The minister let us know that the Central Revenue Agency was a baby of the Right Honorable Member for St. Peter. But while he was doing it, why didn't he tell you that the Right Honorable Member for St. Peter had a policy paper that determined that customs was not to be part of the Central Revenue Authority? And that that is still the position of the Barbados Labour Party. You, you understand, sir, it is the half statements. I can't say half truths because it would be unparliamentary. The half statements that continue to hurt this country. Remember, I hate to interrupt you, but, but don't go there. You know you're not permitted to do that. They're half, half truths or half truths. Better not you say you can't say them. So please withdraw the comment. Let's I have it stuck it, from the, cup, the record. The yes. inability to tell us the full facts of that cabinet paper that would suggest that it was not only authored by the member for St. Peter, but that the member for St. Peter had intended that the customs department would never become a member of any Barbados or Central Revenue Agency. In fact, it is significant that the member for St. Peter referred to it as a Central Revenue Authority and not as a Barbados Revenue Authority to use the unfortunate word that women are wondering, why are they being unfaired by people talking negatively about bras all the time? <laughs> the Attorney General would love that because that's the only language you understand. <laughs> let, let us get serious, sir. You, you know what is so bad about this process? And the public needs to hear this. Do you know, sir, that the customs officers are yet to be given a paper telling them what are the posts that they're supposed to go to and the job descriptions? Do you know that the customs officers were handed a paper telling them what happened at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital? Do you know that all of the documentation thus far relates to the Queen Elizabeth Hospital that went to a board and not to a customs officer going to a bra? But then you are trying to harass people and tell them they must go for a July 1 deadline when you are not even ready. When you have them coming into an agency where the senior leadership is not of customs, does not understand the role of customs, where you have a board that is politically handpicked by a minister, and I'm not talking negatively about this board now, but it is our view to the extent that the Barbados Revenue Authority must have a board. It ought to reflect the board of the National Insurance Scheme that is reflective of labor capital and the government. But must not be handpicked by any minister, that side, this side, any side. It is wrong. Because revenue matters are confidential matters. And there is nothing, as this minister will find out, that will irk people more than the notion that politicians have access to their business. This is a small society. And those are the dangers that we face in the management of entities within a small society. But I go further. The customs agency has a responsibility also for border security. And customs has been left in the invidious position. Sir, I am so sh shattered. When I look at what was really happening at customs, do you know that between the controller, the deputy controller, the controller one and the controller two, that if they got 25, 30% of the people appointed at customs, you got a lot? In fact, the customs officers are now referring to customs as Hollywood. You know, you have Bo Bollywood and Hollywood and Nollywood for all of the acting. They now refer to customs in Barbados as Hollywood. 
Because everybody who is a customs officer in Barbados is acting. And they feel between the guards and themselves that they have not had a fair hearing as to why this is not appropriate. They have argued with legitimacy and cogency that the Customs Department of Canada was initially included in Revenue Canada and had to be taken back out because there are serious reasons as to purpose and as to why it cannot work in a revenue authority. When I say to the customs officers, the Barbados Labour Party has not changed its policy. We still believe that customs should not be included in a revenue authority in this country. So I want to deal with some of the other measures in this budget. Because you know, the minister went through some of them, as I said, coming largely from the IMF tax. Eh? The private sector commented this morning on the likely impact of the measures related to group under corporation taxes and the changing of the carrying forward of the losses from nine years to seven years. People don't know how to implement it. People don't know how to move. And people fear that it may well lead to others seeking to redomicile their groups of companies from here because we are making ourselves less attractive. So when I say with sincerity that the minister did not have measures for growth in this budget, it is because it just simply isn't here. I will go through the rest of them, sir. I spoke about the VAT registration from 80 to 200,000 and the, un the unfortunate impact on the small businesses who will not now be able to claim back VATs and who, VAT and who will, will be affected negatively. I speak, sir, about something that is not in this budget, but that is equally worrisome to people in the renewable energy sector. This government continues to argue that it is trumping renewable energy, forgetting that the Barbados Labour Party in 2007 had a green paper on the same matter. They're not breaking new ground. And while we support renewable energy together, what we can't support is how this government has unfolded its whole program with renewable energy and the likely impact on the sector. A program has been announced for persons to be able to deal with applications and license fees. I'm looking for the fees in relation to renewable energy, Mr. Speaker. I believe it was the Minister of Tourism who might have introduced the measures in here a few months ago. People with photovoltaics have been told that they have to have a license. I have to renew this license fee every year. And look at the table here, Mr. Speaker. There's an application fee for everything above 100 kilowatt hours for $1,000. Sorry, $100. Well, I like a thousand, a thousand. An issuing fee for everything above 1,000 kilowatt hours for $250, with the exception of that over 20 to 30,000 kilo, um, kilowatts, which is $450. But it's the current annual fee that matters. That moves from non-domestic, I and mean, these are all non-domestic photovoltaics, you're affecting the cost of doing business. And it ranges from $7,000 at the lower end to $130,000 that persons must pay per year to have photovoltaics installed in their businesses. This is it here, no not surprise. And then there's something called a renewal fee. And people don't know the difference between the current annual fee and the renewal fee. And the current annual fee runs $6,000, $8,000, And the proposed annual fee is to be reduced in part if the private sector have their way. But you know what's the most insidious thing about all of that, sir? You know, since February, nobody knows where to go and pay this license fee. They don't know to whom they pay the license fee, and they don't know where to pay the license fee, and government says it's short of money. It is unbelievable, sir, the level of incompetence. 
But we are not to be surprised, sir, because as I said, this government is so busy trying to make as if that it does not spend its time dealing with the things that it needs to deal with. And that is why the state of small business and international business and all other productive sectors in this country is what it is. I would like the Minister of International Business to tell me whether he has persuaded the Prime Minister to put Invest Barbados under his portfolio or not. I know that the Prime Minister travels for environmental matters and other things, but I don't, I have not seen the Prime Minister traveling for investment promotion. But Barbados needs it. And Barbados cannot have in the estimates an amount being put for investment promotion for Invest Barbados that only covers wages. But yet international business is responsible for generating a level of taxation under corporate taxation in this country that used to keep our corporation taxes healthy. And if you look at government's revenue, the real decline has come in the decline of corporation taxes, which we were earning over $532 million when we left government in 2007, which is now earning the country less than $200 million in corporation taxes. It has been a veritable implosion. And a large part of that is not only Barbadian businesses, not earning profits, but it is also the international business sector. And the environment is changing. We would have thought that a Minister of Finance would have come here yesterday and spoken to us about our date with destiny with the WTO at the end of this year. And I expect others in this debate to speak about it. Because Barbados will lose the right to be able to support fiscal incentives and export allowances for the export of goods because it will now be in conflict with WTO rules. And to his credit, the member for St. Peter has spoken about it over and over and over and over. But it reminds me of 1994 all over again. Because in 1994, Minister of Finance came into this house and within weeks of signing with the WTO and committing to the dismantling of non-tariff barriers and quotas in this country, he said not a word in the budget and gave us a bus fare and lunch money budget and never told the country that he had committed to a process of dismantling tariffs, non-tariff barriers, and quotas that led the Labour Party as a government to have to find tens of millions of dollars to try to support a flagging manufacturing sector at the end of the 1990s in this country going into the 21st century. Not a word from a Minister of Finance on those matters. Not a word from the Minister of Finance as to the need for a National Tourism Refurbishment Fund in order to make sure that hotels that need refurbishment in this country can be appropriately refurbished such that they can command the average daily rates in Barbados that they need to be commanding. We have had years and years now of the underperformance of the tourism sector in this country. But we know that it is the first sector that can truly lead the way. But it is not going to lead the way in the way in which this government has been proceeding. We left tourism earning $2.5 billion in revenue. Prices have gone up by 35% in Barbados in the seven years. So if the tourism revenue was just to stay constant, tourism should be earning for this country $3.3 billion. But instead, tourism earned for Barbados last year $1.9 billion. I want to repeat it. Tourism earned for Barbados $1.9 billion instead of the $3.3 billion if it was to be to Barbados today, what it was to Barbados in 2007. Operating costs continue to increase in this country. And yesterday's budget will no longer lead to additional costs. I have already spoken about the lack of equity between Sanders. Nobody has a problem with Sanders. What we have a problem with is a lack of a level playing field. And the government can choose to hide behind that, or it can confront the reality that Barbadian hoteliers are hurting. They are hurting. And if we look at the increases 
Stop talking about numbers increasing. Let's talk about the real value. Show me the money. Show me the jobs. Show me the increase in reserves. Show me the increase in service charge. How can Barbados Hotel tourism be rebounding if Sandy Lane Hotel cannot pay and will not pay a 3% increase to workers agreed to since 2010? How can Barbados tourism be rebounding when hoteliers are still saying they can't pay for any increase this year in spite of the fact that the Minister of Tourism correctly and us correctly have said that the workers must be allowed to bear some of the improvements in their salaries to reflect the increases that the government is boasting about. When this is the best ever tourist season in seven years, 25 years, whatever years, then the workers must be compensated. But instead, stories are bung of Sanders on a 35 hour work week because the numbers obviously can't support staff on a 40 hour work week. Make signals. And when you look at the 2014 numbers, sir, the biggest increase in length of stay in the arrivals coming to Barbados last year was in people spending 24 hours or less. You understand what I'm saying? That there was a 75% increase in people spending 24 hours or less. We are glad for the airlift, and I'm sure the Minister of Tourism will tell you that they coming through here will help command his ability to keep those planes flying. But for the rest of the country and for the Minister of Finance and others, the only benefit Barbados got was perhaps a roti and a drink during that 24 hours from them. And if they were health conscious, a piece of chicken and some salad from Chefet. That's not 75% increase would have led to us getting last year from the tourists who come. So that the increased operating costs and the low rates of return continue to be a significant bugbear for Barbados' tourism industry. We have said that we need to set ourselves a target of $4 billion in earning of tourism. And we need to set ourselves a target as to how we can get there. There are some things that I do not feel should divide a country. And some of the strategic issues for building capacity since 20, 2012, I stood in this parliament and called for our National Tourism Refurbishment Fund to be able to help, help our people have access. The Barbados Labour Party set up a small hotels tourism fund and a tourism development fund, small hotel investment fund, and a tourism loan fund. We put $35 million in the small hotel investment fund and $30 million in the tourism loan fund. And by the time this government came to office, they were both in need of capitalization. A request of $20 million was needed to cover and replenish the small hotel investment fund, and indeed $27 million for the tourism loan fund. I say to the Minister of Tourism, while I believe that a national tourism refurbishment fund is where we must go, at least replenish those funds and allow hoteliers to be able to put up their stuff, sir and to do what they have to do. Sir, I am not going to talk at length today on energy prices other than to say that the cess which the government is now purporting to use to go to the Queen Elizabeth Hospital, first of all, the legality of the issue has to be satisfied because I don't know how BNOC can collect a cess on gas from every consumer and that that money is then to go to finance the hospital. And even if it were legal and to go, the hospital is only being guaranteed of that cess for one year. So that the Minister of Finance has in no way resolved the issues of healthcare financing in this country or the sustainability thereof of it. Similarly, the $20 million capital fund do not have a difficulty with a $20 million health endowment fund, but to take it from the catastrophe fund at the beginning of hurricane season requires a level of extraordinary faith or folly on the part of the Minister of Finance. And then to say that it is because the catastrophe fund was not set up correctly is to tell us that he is interested in politics and details rather than protecting the people of Barbados who may become victims of floods or hurricanes in this hurricane season. You don't collapse something that was intended to protect ordinary Barbadians. And the regional 
catastrophe mechanism to which he referred is a mechanism that benefits the government. The catastrophe fund was intended to benefit individuals in this country. And we know what it is, but then again, this is a Minister of Finance who announced to the groundbreaking of Sam Lords on the anniversary of Hurricane Janet in September, on the 22nd of September at 10.15 this year. That's what he did yesterday. So you are now to collapse a catastrophe fund to put money for the hospital. Well, those who are cute might say that this government has presided over the hospital becoming a catastrophe, and hence it meets the criteria. And that's the truth. So that we have a situation, sir, that the actions continue to befuddle all of us. And I say simply, that the promises made to the doctors at the hospital and to the other health care providers that they were to be discussing health care funding since the beginning of the year has not come to pass. And in truth and in fact, they are being promised yet again late in the year that they are to be discussing health care funding. Sir, in relation to the other social services and institutional aspect of this country, it is our contention that this government has done nothing to address issues that are causing us to be more and more uncompetitive. You cannot have a court system that is giving people court dates 18 months from now and expect to promote Barbados as a domicile for doing business. You can't get business done through the court system in this country. But then again, this government has presided over the institutional decay of this country, over the court system, over the police. You have, a acting, you have a commission of police on leave now for two years. You have police officers who brought cases against the service commission and who were told last year, we are going to bypass you with promotions. Don't mind all you are doing is to exercise your legitimate right under the Constitution to bring cases against the police service commission for bias and judicial review because they were recommended for promotion by the substantive commissioner and all of a sudden recommendations coming from a officer junior to the commissioner were given prominence by a police service commission. This government has presided over the political tribalization of the Royal Barbados Police Force and it is to the country's detriment. It is a fact and everybody knows it. And you know what is sad? You cannot take a chairman of a public police service commission and have a person appointed who left at a junior rank to four or five ranks over which he now has to supervise. Because it goes beyond politics then. But it isn't only there. The level of labor unrest in Barbados is now hurting the country and its competitiveness from Light and Power to Sandy Lane, which is obviously going to be on the horizon again, to customs, which continues to remain unsettled, to the psychiatric hospital, where the Minister of Health is yet to give this country a satisfactory explanation for the conditions under which people are functioning under the psychiatric hospital. Food must be brought from the geriatric hospital every day. Sometimes breakfast gets there at 11 o'clock. The member for Christchurch West produced pictures in this house. The member for St. Thomas, the member for St. Michael Southeast. You have conditions that you would not even expect. Slaves living in the 17th or 18th century in the most dismal of Barbados to be subject to. And all because Nobody goes down there often enough to see them, and then the staff have to work in those conditions. Well, I'm happy to hear the NUPW has finally started to make some noise on their behalf, because nobody should be made to either live or work under those conditions. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, sir, the industrial unrest is affecting this country and there is a callous, you could imagine that a whole transport board strike a morning because a minister sends a cousin to work 
in circumstances where the government sends home hundreds of people from the transport board. I mean, how can we accept that as being legitimate? And these are what the workers are saying, you know. But you have a situation, sir. I, 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 I let us look at it. This government social partnership, the social partnership of Barbados has not met in full since July 2014. But up and down the academic world, up and down the Commonwealth, up and down the region, people hold up Barbados as having a social partnership, a good thing for governance. And a government in the midst of recession, in the midst of societal turbulence, does not meet with the social partnership now for 11 months as a full social partnership? Can this government really be fit to lead Bajans? And then there's the national insurance scheme. I want to issue a warning here today to the directors of the national insurance fund because they need to remember that they have a fiduciary duty, not to the government of Barbados, but to the National Insurance Fund, by law. And the Barbados Labour Party regards it as a serious fiduciary duty. This government has been allowed to accumulate $220 million in arrears. $220 million in arrears to the National Insurance Scheme for what? for contributions, for reimbursement of non-contributory pensions, which the central government ought and will normally reimburse them for, for non-contributory pensioners, for the rental of buildings, two buildings that the government made the National Insurance Scheme bill since 2008, for which they have paid probably only one month's rent for each, in spite of occupying them for years. And they want to stop people from working in this country because they owe tax arrears. When the government is the biggest defaulter, the biggest body in Barbados owing people money. But if that were the case, then the Minister of Finance and every member of cabinet should not work from next month. If we were to apply the same measurement to them. And then the National Insurance Fund scheme is compounded by this government forcing them to take up government paper. We left the National Insurance Scheme holding $1.4 billion in government paper in 2007. Would you believe that the National Insurance Scheme has more than doubled that amount of government paper and now owes over $3 billion in government paper holding for the government of Barbados in seven years? And the AG can talk about showing confidence what confidence? The same national insurance scheme that is not allowed to invest in anything outside of Barbados. Mr. Speaker, the old people told us, do not put all your eggs in one basket. If, God forbid, Barbados was to face a disaster of some type, the national insurance fund would be at risk because it would suffer a lot of collateral damage as a result of the damage to assets in Barbados. And while I accept that the National Insurance Fund must help to bring about development in this country by being a source of funding for development, there still has to be some balance. You can't preclude them from investing overseas. And we believe that the time has come for a relook of the investment guidelines of the National Insurance Fund to help trigger growth in this country, not just to finance government projects, but to also have projects financed within the private sector that can bear the commercial rate of return that makes the board feel comfortable with investing in those projects. And Mr. Speaker, I also believe that the resources, human resources of the National Insurance Scheme must not be subject to the Public Service Commission. Part of the reason why Barbadians are having difficulties getting their checks is because decisions are made as to the allocation of staff without reference to the needs of the National Insurance Fund, which manages over $4 billion. 
You can't take up people and move them willy-nilly, like if you're moving them from one government department to the next, without there being consequences. And I'm saying to you that the government has a person as Minister of Labor in charge of national insurance who is literally out of her debts. Way, way out of her debts. And who is more interested in the fanciful things of life than in the substantive realities of the National Insurance Fund remaining stable. Now I say to you, Mr. Speaker, that we, I'm not being unfair, because the person is not a person I dislike, but the person is not up to the task of managing the National Insurance Fund or scheme or being accountable for it. Look, something as simple as a heart. I would expect that a doctor has a heart. Pensioners cannot get checks for weeks, for months. Pensioners. And would you expect that the most natural thing for the National Insurance Department to do would be to pick up the number and call the utility companies and tell them whole strain on the people who have not gotten their pension checks. Would you not expect that the same natural thing for a minister to do who had a heart would be to speak to the minister in charge of welfare and try and put some interim mechanism in place as we call for, for food stamps or food vouchers or something if they had a heart. But first thing I learned Sunday, I, I, People bombard me again and tell me that they didn't get the pension since last Thursday. And this is not a case of a person who got two and three accounts. These are people who are living from check to check to check to check. And when these things happen, they lose faith and confidence in the institution. And that is what we mean by institutional decay. But you know, sir, I say to you that what more do you expect from a government that is not focused on the delivery of Barbadians to safety, that is not focused on the revitalization of the productive sectors, but that is focused instead, Mr. Speaker, on ensuring that each of them can survive how they may, wherever they may. I know what makes this difficult to take. That yesterday the Minister of Finance said to Barbados, in spite of all the evidence that we are disposed to help a few in this country, I am still going to put $200 million in taxes on the majority of the Barbadian population who can't take it. In spite of all of the questions about how contracts are awarded in this country, about how ministers all of a sudden have an apparent callous disregard to conflict of interest. I know what is amazing is that I wonder where the rest of the society is. Where are the voices of the church? Where are the voices of civil society? Things can happen in this country And nobody says anything because they are frightened to say or they are affected by the sociology of smallness, which is that they don't want to offend. But I have come to the conclusion, sir, that the suffering in Barbados is too great. And I need now to speak to a few issues and to ask for a few answers. And I want to ask the Prime Minister for the answers because it is he and only he who is responsible for the conduct of this government as a whole. The notion that a few people can do well. No more than five. One, two, three, four, five. You can pick the names. Mark my words. Mark them. But it doesn't start and end there. I have heard ministers ignore comments on this side. The member for St. Joseph raised it in a, 
a political meeting, I think we had in your constituency, Mr. Speaker, at the beginning of this year, that we were forced to have in St. Michael West to address matters known to you and the rest of us, to which I will not refer now. And the member for St. Joseph asked about how it is possible for two ministers to be driving cars owned by a company called TransTech, who all of a sudden is receiving more and more work, contractual work from the Sanitation Services Authority and from the Transport Board. From the Transport Board, at a time when UCAL is still owed close to $20, $22 million, and the people from UCAL had checks bounced to them from the Transport Board, up to last week, Transport Board bounced checks to UCAL last week. Remember, for Christchurch East is showing me a piece of paper and opening it as if he is causing somebody to be scared or intimidated. But I hope that he couldn't mean me, because I have learned in this country that I will do my duty. And the number XG10 is driven into this parliament every week. And MM110 is not owned by TransTech. And let us get it straight. I expect every member of this government to curse me from hell to high water tomorrow when I'm done in the next 45 minutes. Stay tuned. Because what is at stake here is not whether I like the archbishop or not. And he's not an archbishop of a church, as we already know. That's not what is at stake here. What is at stake here is the exercise of public duty. There is not a single member on this side who holds the ministerial responsibility in the executive of Barbados. There is not a single member who appoints boards. There is not a single member who is responsible for trying to influence how boards give contracts. A previous board member of the Sanitation Services Authority, before the last election, wrote a letter complaining about how the Minister of Environment interfered. Remember for St. James South, St. James Central, spoke about it at length before the last election. But what we have today now is a company that is purporting to fix transmissions. I don't have anything against the company, but what I have something against is the lack of appearance of the right thing. I, 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 you know, if it was a case that was just as simple as that, I would keep quiet, you know. He can talk about all he wants about St. Leonard, St. Lucy. Let me tell you, that this is the well, 16th of June, 17th? Huh? Today is the 16th of June, 2015. This is the government of Barbados. Mr. Speaker, I am not intimidated by an Archbishop of... <laughs> Mr. Speaker? Mr. Speaker, as much as the member wants to interrupt the debate, he cannot change the fact. Where's the phone? Uh, go on, wait, no start. Uh, anybody who's getting hungry at home or in here, go and get a little something to eat because it no start. It no start. Mr. Speaker, is the member for Christchurch East worried about something? His voice now is becoming as annoying as a, as annoying as a doberman with dentures. As annoying as a doberman with dentures. 
Mr. Speaker, transmission, transmissions are replaced by that company called Transtech. Let the same minister who is making so much noise ask and tell this parliament before tomorrow night, what is the price paid for the replacement of each transmission in each sanitation service truck and for each transport board bus? The Minister of Housing, sorry, Transport, no. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Minister of Housing. He's no Minister of Transport. His license number has changed to PA 826. But both of them are registered to Transtech. Now, I don't want to hear that Transtech is offering them finance, because finance, listen, is not available to other Barbadians at Transtech for companies across the board. But what I do know is that I want them to understand that if there is nothing untoward, then come out and clear the situation. But what I do know is this, that if it is true, Let's have some order. Mr. Speaker, it does not bother me that he wants to attack me because he can want to attack me more by the time I finish. Does the truth rest start on him yet, sir? I am only laying the wicket, sir. <laughs> I would hope that you do. <laughs> well, well, member, please let's have some more. Then. Mr. Speaker, the public of Barbados can hear the response of a man who professes to have a doctorate in theology. They can hear him. Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Honorable member, I want before, to know. Before you proceed, though, um, just a word of caution. Uh, I refer you to stand in order 28. 10. No reference may be made in debate to the character or conduct of any person except in his official or public capacity. And in those circumstances, 2810B says, any member who desires to refer in debate to the character or conduct of any person in his official capacity must deliver to the speaker written prior notice of the proposed reference. The notice must set out the facts on which such reference will be based and must be signed by the member giving it. I am just cautioning you at this stage aware, because sir. I think you are coming very close to offending that. Standard. I'm aware, sir. I am fundamentally aware of that, and I thank you for reminding me, sir. But I just want the Minister of Public Works and the Minister of Housing to tell us what is the cost paid by the Transport Board and the Sanitation Service Authority, respectively, for the repairing of transmissions. <coughs> Minister of um, Public Works and the Minister of Environment, sorry, for the cost of transmissions repaid, repaired at the Sanitation Service Authority and at the Transport Board. If it is, sir, that the cost is 35,000 to 40,000 a transmission, sir, can the ministers equally tell us whether it is true that the quotation we have received from Recton International in Miami who are the agents for Allison Transmission, who build transmissions, and who have determined that the cost of, the cost of 500 series transmissions for use in an SSA freight liner garbage truck or transport board bus should cost no more than 3,800 US or 7,600 Barbados. And that when you add the four to $500 to it, that that price should be no more before profit of 8000 and certainly not after profit at $35,000 and $40,000. So I am not getting in any fight. This is a matter of the public funds of this country. And the member for St. Joseph, as well as the person who sits in the other place, who is in the constituency of the member for Christchurch East, have raised this matter publicly. But you see, sir, politics in this country has descended to the point where matters legitimately raised of the expenditure of public funds are to be treated through abuse. Mr. Speaker, 
Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I can understand that a man that was confronted by me on the television screens in 2003 as not having a doctorate from an institution that does not produce doctorates for the, what he said he had it, would feel that he needs to attack me for my qualifications as a lawyer. I, sir, was recommended to attend the London School of Economics by no less a person than the right excellent Errol Walton Barrow, a former leader of the Democratic Labour Party. I have nothing more to say about the academic career. I remember, please, this is from I was across the floor. Sir, I wonder what the member for Christchurch East will say when I move on. Because let me now move, sir, to the other things that are affecting the quality of governance in this country. And why a Minister of Finance would have to come and inflict tax after tax after tax to the tune of $200 million yesterday such that people in this country do not know how they will face next week or next month. I know the sad part of it, half the cabinet don't even know what's going on. That's the sad part of it. Sir, in this country, a few persons have been allowed to benefit, Mr. Speaker, from extraordinary concessions and from extraordinary payments that others have not benefited from. Mark my words. Mark my words. We have a situation, sir, where the same contractor has benefited at a time when nobody else in Barbados in the aftermath of the last election could get their bills paid in full. One contractor, Preconco, gets 23.8 or 23.5 million dollars for the sale of Valerie, for the construction of Valerie, a low-income housing project built. And I'm sure that the Prime Minister and the Minister of Tourism, whose constituency it is, and the Prime Minister whose constituency it is next to, could not justify the cost of $548 per square foot for the construction of low-income housing in this country. This is not construction on the West Coast, on the Platinum Coast. This is construction that would not otherwise cost more than $200 a square foot to build. But what is even more is that you don't only get the construction being done, but when nobody else in Barbados can get their bills paid, when companies are sucking salt, trying to get their bills paid, to be able to find money to keep employees employed. And one company gets $23.8 million dollars not just the sum of money due and owing, but three months' interest. You can't get, you can't find, Mr. Speaker, people in Barbados happy because they can't get the income tax refunds. They can't get the VAT refunds. And one company can carry home that amount. But it doesn't stop there, Mr. Speaker. This is the same company that is building out birth five, of which the minister spoke yesterday. This is the same company or related company, Mr. Speaker, that as recent as two, three months ago, and I need an explanation for this, could receive $24.7 million, $24.215 million, sorry, for building the Grotto housing project. Once again, at exorbitant rates in excess of $540 a square foot. For low income housing, again. But what is more is that a memorandum goes from the Ministry of Finance to the Accountant General.
telling the Accountant General on the 31st of March of this year, half the cabinet don't know about this, you know, the 31st of March of this year, that finance is directed to inform the Accountant General, and listen carefully, that the housing credit fund managed by the Central Bank of Barbados has declared a dividend of $25 million to pay this contractor through the national housing, $24.2 million. Now, how does a housing credit fund that is a revolving fund established to on lend to mortgage to persons to provide mortgages, financial intermediary, how does a housing credit fund that is a revolving fund declare a dividend? Mr. Speaker, tell the member for Christchurch East that the only thing he does is to offend my eyesight by purporting to be an archbishop. He cannot intimidate me anytime 